Hi, I'm Dr. Greg Goins from the Reimagined Schools podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, welcome back. Steve here. And today I'm talking with Candy Campbell, actor, author, filmmaker, and can help you with employee engagement and retention. Awesome show. You're going to learn so much. And, and then, by the way, before you go, it'd be so cool if you you know, went to my website. And while you're there, there's a couple things you could do to help out the podcast. Uh, number one, you know, you could tell a friend. That would be so awesome. You could uh, tell a friend, give a link to the podcast, and say, you ought to listen to Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12. That would be cool. A second thing you could do at my website, you could... Uh, uh, leave a review as well as subscribe to the website. That would be awesome. And and finally, on the front page of my website, I have a link. It's called Buy Me a Coffee. By clicking on this link, you can donate a dollar or two to help me deal with the costs of producing the podcast. You're awesome. That would be so cool. Enjoy the show. It's really different when you get to put on a costume and become someone else as opposed to doing stand-up when you're generally being yourself. And I wasn't used to that. And it was awkward and uncomfortable. And um, so I noticed that the other people in the class, and there was like six or seven other people, were a lot more relaxed on the stage. And they all were taking improv. So I started taking improv. And within, well, within that year, Four of us peeled off from just doing comedy and said, you know what, we we could do this. It's the education podcast, your favorite show, with lots of groovy guests and they share what they know. So crank it up the tin and let your neighbors know that here's another show with Dr. Steve Milletto. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Ah, ah, with Dusty Maletto. Dr. Candace Candy Campbell, award-winning actor, author, filmmaker, has good news for leaders tearing out their hair because of employee disengagement, or worse, poor employee retention. Her doctoral work, completed with interprofessional groups at Stanford and subsequent books, deal with mitigating this very issue of the cultural miscommunication issues that are at root of the problem. The solution? Candy uses her 20-plus years experience as an actor, director, coach, facilitator, and her 40 years in the healthcare industry to help leaders create a culture where everybody wants to work and nobody wants to leave. She co-founded an improv comedy company in the San Francisco area and began teaching applied improvisation to businesses in the mid-90s. She has written and produced three solo shows, including the latest, An Evening with Florence Nightingale, a Reluctant Celebrity. Other works include Improv to Improve Healthcare, a System for Creative Problem Solving, Improv to Improve Your Leadership Team, Channeling Florence Nightingale, Integrity, Insight, Innovation, Micro Premature Babies, How Low Low Can You Go, which is a film, and several children's books. Our focus today will be on uh, her focus of helping to create a work culture that no one wants to leave. Candy, thanks so much for being on the show and say hi to everyone. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, glad you're here, and uh, let's start with this. When you reached out to me on uh, PodMatch, you you noted that you were a recovering academic. (laughs) Let's start there. Uh, Well, uh, let's see. Okay, I can say from, because we can see each other, we're, we're of a certain age group, and golly, right away, I can say that academia has been uh, even though I was at a, a religious school, uh, it's a a battleground of political correctness. And I'm often not very politically correct. And so <laughs> I believe in truth telling and saying things as you see it in a kind way. That's not that doesn't always go well with people. So uh and and I think a lot of students that come into uh, academia, and this is a subject that's gotten more and more play, are there not really because they want to learn. They have this hunger to learn. It's because they feel they've got to go in order to be successful in whatever it is. And, they, and they're not necessarily there because they love what they're studying. They just 
want to sit, do as little as possible, get the grade and move on with their life. And I think that's unfortunate. Oh, you got that right. That's very unfortunate. I've run into that a lot in, uh, uh, in the world of education where we are, a lot of, uh, you know, it's, it very much fits the same thing. And, you know, it's a big part of education is something um, that a lot of, I, I don't know if it's, you know, the, just the thought that they could just have a nine to five job or, you know, but getting into education, one of the things, if you're working K through 12, one of the things that makes a difference is uh, you spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to reach the kids and work with the kids. And, mm. and mm. Uh, I'm a former high school teacher, assistant principal and principal. And um, a lot of th things that you have to do is do like sponsor clubs and, and um, be a sp uh, sports coach or something like this. And that's where the real difference happens a lot of times is because you help them see a different world. And unfortunately there's, there's this thought today that, you know, it's like, no, I'm going to work from this hour to this hour, or you know, let me do it just remotely or, and it's like, well, yeah, that's, that's not how it works. So that, that, uh, Politically correctness stuff about uh, saying it nice. No, it's like no. This is not the, the world of <laughs> of working with kids is a lot different than that. So I, I understand my my filter, as I've uh, I, I like to say, is uh, is lacking um, sometimes. <laughs> 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 but uh, good stuff. Thanks for explaining that. Uh, so you're you're an actor, mm -hmm. but we're a nurse. Could you talk about why you left nursing to pursue acting? Well, interestingly, I know a lot of people assume it that way, but it's really the other way around. Uh, my first <laughs> my first bachelor's is in theater and acting. And it was, I, I abandoned that after I had what uh, we used to call a casting couch experience. And um, I, uh, I said, well, you know, I'm, that's not the way the game is played in my world. So forget that. And I just gave up acting for over a decade. And in the interim, I didn't know what to do. You can imagine if, I mean, I know some people who take a degree in the arts, they are pretty lost that first year or so afterwards because there's not always a, a, a path. You know, if you get to be an accountant or something, you can get to work right away and do pretty well and be happy in, in that and, and certainly your parents, and that you, you've come, you've studied something, and you're applying it right away. Well, it surely wasn't the, the case with me. I went home with my tail between my legs, and my parents were like, you see, we told you, you shouldn't have taken that degree. <laughs> and so I didn't know what to do. So happily, I can say, um, I was hired, even though I don't look like Barbie and I'm not a tall person, I was hired because of my language ability to be a flight attendant with uh, the famous or infamous Pan Am. And I, um, I flew around the world for, for five years, 120 countries, and I call it my longest running acting gig. Nice. <laughs> you know, costume, makeup. And uh, kind of an improv script. So uh, what happened was, uh, and I tell the story about how 30,000 feet up, I got the call to be a nurse. And I've never looked back. And once, you know, you bring whatever you have to social sciences, and I think teaching is like that too, um, whatever's in you comes out. And so... That is why my subtitle became Blending Art and Science for Positive System Change. Because when you've already been in the world and then you come into a different industry, you have a different view, a different lens on some of the problems there. And right away, I could see, whoa, this is different than aviation. Where, and I mean, I'm not an aviator, but I was in the aviation industry because um, the aviation industry, the, all of the airlines are, are based on the military model. It's been, it's been softened, if you will. But the thing that I took away that I, I tried to uh, instill in my work as a nurse is this whole idea of team building and 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 team playing, and and uh, 
that was something that I really cherished from my time as a, a flight attendant. I know people say, oh, you were just a, a glorified waitress, but you know, really safety was our first and foremost concern. We drilled like firemen drill, you know, about certain safety procedures, et cetera. We were always uh, communicating with a cockpit. There wasn't a hierarchy of their better and we're, we're, you know, grunts or anything like that. But then I came into healthcare and there was this huge hierarchy. And um, yeah, I wasn't used to that. And I thought, hmm, this needs to change. And so uh, slowly but surely, that's how I got back into um, the acting again. Very cool. The, uh, you know, and I can say as a flight attendant, I would think that it's a huge lesson in, you know, we're getting ready to start talking about a little bit about your improv stuff. And I would think that there's a huge lesson in speaking, talking, how to interact with people who may not be the happiest at the moment, (laughs) um, or have some challenges that you're trying to figure out how to, uh, help them through. Like, uh, the, my, my favorite always being the person who right after the sign is turned on that says, you know, buckle up, <laughs> they're up out of their seat. And it's like, really? That's, that's not what that says. That's not, but there's always someone nicely saying, uh, you know, sir or ma'am, um, can I see you just a second? And they, they're trying to get them to sit back down or whatever. And I, th- I think that's a pretty interesting talent right there. I, and, it, you know, it's as someone who um, not so long ago, about a year and such, um, went through some major surgery, um, one of the things I learned about uh, – I, I mean, I've interacted with healthcare um, nurses and doctors and and uh, the different staff that are there and such, but uh, um, really stood out the ones who understood how to work with people who are not in the best of worlds <laughs> um, because of what's ever going on and suddenly made it, knew how to interact just to say, because they kind of, to me, it felt like they had a, they understood that you were not, <laughs> you know, your world's all messed up now because of what happened. And so you're trying to figure things out. And uh, I thought that was cool. So it's to me that the two fields kind of go together when it comes to something like that. So. Oh, I agree. I used to tell my students as we um, prepared to go into a room and uh, we would always be briefed a bit, you know, we would have the idea of why that person was in the hospital we would know what the diagnosis was. Um, very often we would or wouldn't know <clears throat> much about their history. And uh, I used to say, you know, we're going to walk through what is effectively a proscenium arch. <laughs> we're going to go on to the stage and we are going to talk to these people and make sure that what they perceive is what we understand and we're there for X, Y, and Z reasons. But don't forget that this is probably one of the worst times of their life. And, you know, to be really kind to them. Also with newer nurses, I used to always say, uh, ask first day of class, how many of you have ever either been a hospital patient or have been a family member where you've been in the hospital with your loved one and a nurse came in and you could tell in seconds if you were going to get along with that person, if you really liked that nurse or not. And everybody knew immediately because there is a, an empathic, that's almost like a gene, but you know, you know when people are there to help you and that's why we call it a calling. And that's why I also told my new nurses <clears throat> Listen, I, we're going to go around the room and I'd like you in just a couple of sentences at the most, just tell everybody why you decided to take, um, you decided to take a degree in nursing. And I heard pretty much the same reasons. Either it is my calling. I think I really need to make a difference in the lives of people. The best one, of course. Uh, or uh, golly, I, I looked at all the jobs and, and I know I'll always have a job, but it looks like the world always needs nurses, uh, and they pay. Okay. 
or sometimes it was, well, I, I, I thought about being a doctor, but you know, that's a lot of school. So this will do. And, uh, another one, everybody in my family seems to be in nursing or healthcare. And so that's what I'm going to do. And I begged the people who had the last three reasons to finish the course. And then if they still felt the same way, enroll in a different subject, because this particular um, profession is blood, sweat, and tears, literally. And you're going to see people at their worst, mostly sometimes their best when they have a baby. Uh, but it, the, the physical toll, the mental toll, and the emotional toll that it takes is something that needs to be considered. Well, you got that right. That's, you know, it's, I, I've had issues <laughs> before, but nothing like the surgery that I had to have. And one of the, and so after the surgery, um, I was in the hospital for five days and they, uh, um, had this massive, massive bandage on my head, and they, uh, one of the healthcare professionals, one of the nurses, took an interest because I, I was in some crazy pain, and I didn't want to take some of the, I, and I had access to a drip and all that sort of stuff, and I really didn't want that because it, it just seemed to me, I don't know how people get addicted to that stuff because it made it worse, <laughs> and but it. You know, I was like, uh, and I, I had these incredible nightmares, and so I'd be up through the night and stuff. And she'd come in and check on me, and she'd have conversations with me, and talk to me about, you know, what was outside the window because there was a heliport out there, and and different stuff, and just have conversations with me, and that would help me kind of drift back into another world and go to sleep, and and it was the coolest thing. And uh, I made sure that I <laughs> told her afterwards because she helped me then, you know. Because I had to, before I could be released, I had to be able to meet the therapy, the physical therapy abilities to, to walk. <laughs> and, you know, I had to walk with a belt and all that sort of stuff, if you've ever done physical therapy. And oh, it, was yes. just, it was just the neatest thing that she took that type of interest because she must have known how messed up. She, she, had to, she just had the greatest ability to, uh, you know, see through probably what was going through my head, which is just, I need to get out of here. <laughs> and... Uh, um, and help me develop that strength and be able to focus on the stuff that needed to be focused on as I recovered from the pain and such. But uh, I'm babbling now. I didn't mean to do that. But the point is, is that, uh, oh, it's so important. And I, I kind of go back to all that, you know, the ability to have those interactions, you know, develop um, the, the type of empathy that you understand that you start trying to figure out how to help them deal with whatever is going on. So. Well, you're right. And it really, I think, stems from a love of people, which is something that we have in common as teachers. Very much so. Very much so. Very cool. So, all right. So let's let's talk about this. You, you founded an improv comedy company. I love this. Uh, talk about that and what lessons you learned from improv and comedy. Well, to start from the beginning, um, I... Like I said, I'd, I'd been an actor uh, early on, and then after about, uh, well, I had a, I would call it a difficult life event, and I needed to laugh again. And so I found myself in a new city as a single parent of um, three who were 8, 11, and 13 at the time. And and thank God I was a nurse, I am a nurse uh, because I I could be employed. Uh, that was you know money was tight. It was just a huge life change. And after a few months, I thought I just want to laugh again. And providentially enough, in the newspaper, you remember newspapers? There, there yes, was a little yes. article. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was an article about somebody who was having some local classes in what they called clean comedy. So I enrolled and uh, I brought my eight-year-old son, who's very funny himself, and uh, we enrolled in this class. And I thought, <clears throat> well, this this will be good. I'll just learn set up punch and, you know, I'll be good because after all, I have all this actor training. But I learned a couple of things. One was... It's really different when you get to put on a costume and become someone else. 
as opposed to doing stand up when you're generally being yourself. And I wasn't used to that. And it was awkward and uncomfortable. And um, so I noticed that the other people in the class, and there was like six or seven other people, were a lot more relaxed on the stage. And they all were taking improv. So I started taking improv. And within, well, within that year, four of us peeled off from just doing comedy and said, you know what, we, we could do this. And so, so we set up this, uh, this comedy company and by, I guess it was the second or third year in 1995, <clears throat> we were approached to, uh, well, as this engineer in a software company after one of our shows said, you know, what I saw was you all took a problem and you transformed it into some sort of solution. And could you come and do that for my engineers and get them to get, you know, park their egos, play nice and do some friggin' work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, that was, that was the beginning of, of the whole movement of learning about the difference between comedy, improv comedy seeking the funny and improv applied improv working with people to enrich their lives and their relationships and be team team players. I love that. I, I've heard uh, a couple of people talk about how, <laughs> especially in, in education that they've, uh, and I've actually known a teacher who went on and did improv at night. And he was, he was hilarious. He was, he was someone who was very deadpan and that was kind of, it just, the look went with, what he did and how he responded to things. But I, I, he took somebody very serious up on what they said, which is if you're going to be someone who has to talk with people a lot and things like this, you should try improv. And it's, it's cool. And getting a chance to talk with someone who, who's done that. And it's, it's a, uh, it's a neat sort of thing. What do you, what sort of, I mean, what, what's something just really that kind of pops out at you that just kind of, um, you learn that just kind of you employ in whatever you're doing or talking or doing. Uh, working with people. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I would say one of the first things is to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's <laughs> difficult. Nice. That's really difficult. Because when you think about it, people say, oh my gosh, you know, going up in front of people, you don't have a clue what you're going to do. <laughs> that's, 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 you know, walking the tightrope with no net. And, and yet there are principles and, and one of them is, you know, to let go of that little voice inside you that tells you all those negative things that, you know, oh, this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to look like an idiot and um, you shouldn't do this It's danger, danger, danger. And uh, if you can, if you can have a, a camaraderie, which is always great, if that's why the four of us who knew each other started this company, because we felt we could trust each other. But when we find in applied improv, um, we we get everybody to commit right away to the premise, which is if you'll allow yourself to look a little silly and lose face, maybe. A little bit and we're all trusting here and you know whatever happens here stays here like las vegas <laughs> you know that it, we're not gonna make you do anything that's gonna hurt you or or embarrass you or anything like that other than your sense of pride that maybe you didn't know what to do but failure is a gift in improv because that's the twist that if you've ever seen an improv show makes it so hilarious and people don't understand that when they allow themselves to, okay, they say, okay, I'll go with the premise that if I'll just do this, it'll be fun and I'll learn some things. And that this improv mindset, it's a very positive mindset saying yes and uh, instead of no but. And believe me, in teaching and in healthcare especially, I mean, if we if we don't in real life, not improv is like going to the gym and exercising, but in real life, if we don't use 
our our powers of logic to say, okay, this doesn't look right, the no but. Somebody can die. So it's very important to make a distinction between when we're exercising our communication skills and our relationship skills in improv, that we can take those to build trust and build teams as opposed to, oh, we're just going to say yes to everything in real life. That's not practical. So having a yes and mindset while you're exercising, it's kind of turns on <clears throat> an idea in your mind. Uh, we like to say another thing, that words are golden. And that that addresses the idea of looking somebody in the eye and really actively listening, not just telling you how, but doing exercises so you can practice it and take it away. I love that. That's, this is so cool. And it, 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 and it really does fit well with uh, uh, teaching or being a, a building administrator or something like this because of the conversations that you have where you don't really know what's going to happen or someone else is going to say or interact with you about. And uh, so it is always the yes and. <laughs> so I, I think that's cool. So uh, thanks for sharing that. I, you know, now I got to make sure that you share how Florence Nightingale came about, how the, uh, how those shows come about. And I understand the connection with the nursing and stuff like this, but you gotta, you gotta talk about that a little bit. Well, that is kind of a funny story. Um, okay. So, once upon a time, <laughs> when I was an academic, uh, I was um, a professor, at, an assistant professor at the University of San Francisco, and I lived in the suburbs. And you know what it's like living in the suburbs. If you finish up your last classes at four o'clock and three days a week, I was there till four ish. The the commute home was just terrible. I was at least two hours. Jeez. So I, you know, a lot of us would just like, let's go to the cafeteria or whatever. We'll grab a bite. And uh, one day in 2010, <clears throat> we had a faculty meeting and our wonderful uh, librarian, uh, I still know her, Claire Sharifi, she came in and she said, hey, you all, did you know that this is the 100th year anniversary of the death of Florence Nightingale? We're like, <laughs> okay. Yes. And, and she said, well, the thing was the British library and some other people have in celebration of this event have digitized her work. Well, like, well, I know most of us had read the one book that she was famous for, uh, notes on nursing, but Claire said, did you know she wrote like 200 books and articles and we have over 10,000 of her letters like wow. what I have no idea so as as a result for the next three years three days a week instead of getting in my car right away i dialed up my computer and i started reading awesome. and then three years later i'm at a holiday party i'm you know i've been a public speaker for a long time so i'm a member of the national speakers association and one of our friends um Barry Wishner, who I, I dedicated the book channeling Florence Nightingale to, he's, um, you know, we're all chatting and, and, you know, in holiday parties, people you don't see all the time, it's like, hey, what's new? What, what's, what are you excited about? Or what are you thinking? Or, you know, what's happening? And I started talking about what I was learning about Florence Nightingale and the fact that I couldn't, you know, you can, you, you can have training and, and, well, I just say being an academic sort of came through, meaning that after about a month, maybe, of reading her works, I took out a piece of paper and I and I started doing a sort of an ad hoc qualitative research thing where I started putting down categories of themes because I noticed things kept coming up. And that's why the subtitle of the book, Channeling Florence Nightingale, is Integrity, Insight, Innovation. Uh, there was actually six of them, but I combined them. But over and over and over and over, she talked about these things. And then, of course, I learned that she was, oh, my goodness, she was like an early feminist before there was such a thing. And uh, in her, in her nonviolent way, that she pushed against the the status quo in just about every way 
that uh, she was a statistician. And in fact, she was the person that we now could credit for the infographic. She was the first person to do that. And the reason she did, well, she became famous as a nurse, of course, in the Crimean War. Um, she came back and Queen Victoria said, uh, you know, would you would you write, let's redo the British hospital army, army medical hospital system. And, and so when she was assigned different people to work with, including William Farr, who's a, a famous statistician, he said, well, I know um, all this data, we'll just put it in the back of this uh, document. It was over 800 pages in several appendices for the parliament to read because they were going to pass some legislation. She said, oh, I know those people. They're not going to, they need something very simple. And so <laughs> she came up with this design. But anyway, I'm going on like that. And and this guy, Barry, he comes over and he goes, okay, I get it. I get it. You know, you think this Nightingale chick, she's the, the bee's knees. But he said, let me ask you this question. You're an actor. Yes, Barry. And you've already had two solo shows. Yeah. Then why isn't this your third show? I'm like, oh, Barry, it's a lot of work. You don't make that much money. But I no, I am so busy as an academic. Oh, my gosh. Like like you, Steve, you know, they got me uh, I'm, I'm the advisor to the nurses group the student nurses group and i'm and i'm on the parking committee and i'm you know i'm i'm redoing the curriculum and oh my god <laughs> i'm correct i'm working 80 hours a week i don't have time for this right he said okay well let me ask you a question what would have to happen to change your mind i said barry god himself would have to tell me and so the next morning at 9 30 i get a phone call this is God. I'm telling you, you should do the show. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So I said, okay. And then things happened. You know, I started telling that story. It was so funny because, and he was relentless. He called me like a month later and said, hey, what's the progress? You found a director yet? I'm like, oh, gosh, he's going to, he's going to hold me accountable. <laughs> So I was at church, I was talking with some people and thinking about how this is so funny. And I, I don't know, the director for my first um, show, he was, he was out of country. So I didn't, I don't know, I needed, I needed a new director and, and I didn't know where I was going to do this. And, and one of my friends, she says to one of the senior pastors, come here, come here, come here. And so next thing I knew, he said, Oh, you're planning a show? This was in like January. He goes, well, wasn't she a woman of faith? And I said, well, yeah, she was actually. She was. She said, you know, God told her to go and help people and make a difference in their lives and all this. And he said, well, is that part going to be in the show? I said, yeah, I, I guess. I haven't done the show yet. <laughs> he said, well, how about if we book you for December? And then you'll do it. So that's how that started. Nice, nice. That's just a little pressure there, right? <laughs> uh, but it worked. And so anyway, now we were off Broadway last year, and we've been in seven states. We haven't been to Georgia. Well, no, yes, we did, actually. We performed in Atlanta at a conference. But anyway, three countries and, and continuing to tour. So Very cool. All the best with that. That is awesome. Thank I've watched you. some of the videos and... And it's, it's so cool. And, and, and just, you know, just the information that you're talking about in, in itself is just incredible to know about a name that most people have heard the name, but probably know very little about. I like that. All right. So let's shift to work culture and business. I mean, what's the biggest problem in business today and how do you help solve it? And in there, you got to kind of answer this question, which is you don't have an MBA, you're an actor, All right. So <laughs> how can you help businesses? <clears throat> well, I think, especially since COVID, but even leading up to it, you know, COVID was the, the launching pad for a lot of changes in, in our lives, as we all know. But I think people leave their jobs for a lot of reasons. And the kicker is often the vertical relationships there. You know, all the studies say that people leave um, 
you know, the thing that really sets them over the top and they actually leave is because of their managerial or supervisory relationships. And so um, based on, like I said, the the work that I've done for the uh, last many years um, and now, both in, in healthcare and in, in a straight, if you will, businesses, is to equip leaders to bridge that gap between well, you know, in theory, we call it the difference between transactional and transformative leadership. And it really has to do with uh, not just keeping the door closed of your office, but taking the time, being less afraid of litigation and um, and accusations of having favorites. Just, you know, that's why so many uh, CEOs who listen to their HR people say, oh, you know, you can't get too close to people. You can't get to know them. Well, you can just as in any relationship when you have certain boundaries that are stated or unstated, you and, you know, a good leader isn't afraid of people. They understand that people are their greatest asset and the best thing you can do to get people to stay is to be a magnetic, magnetic, I guess, magnetic leader, be the kind of leader nobody wants to leave. And then not just you, of course, but set up the culture so that people who are there know they have the agency to speak up, especially if there's a, a, a risk averse industry, you know. Um, it's it's so important when we Steve when we look at the research about oh golly name your crisis whether it was Chernobyl or you know oh the one that's in the news lately Boeing seven thirty seven Max you know right right if and and there was even uh, gosh if you, if you haven't seen it I don't know did you ever see the documentary on Boeing it was a few years ago it was before the pandemic I think I'm not sure and I've seen that and one. they've had a lot of internal struggles but uh, you know I used I sometimes work as a legal nurse consultant and I can tell you from reading depositions it and and all the research points out to communication lack miscommunication in other words being one of the top three reasons in their root cause analyses that things happen that should never have happened and when we talk about just to give you an example of something that uh, people were afraid to speak up about like in the challenger remember the challenger disaster very much so and the stories came out that, oh, that O-ring, you know, there was problems with it and that uh, the people who tried to speak up weren't listened to and so forth and so on. And this is like a really awful theme that runs through all sorts of uh, cases that most of them never get media attention. But believe me, in healthcare, they happen all the time. And so... I think that that has a lot to do with the culture of being able to speak up. That makes perfect sense. I, I you know, it's, it, it is interesting because that's, if that's not part of the culture, then the opposite is, which is what you just mentioned, which is people being afraid to speak up, you know, mm -hmm. afraid to voice their opinion. And that challenger uh, accident, I, you know, I was in college at the time in, in Florida and I'm walking across campus mm -hmm. and one of my fraternity brothers um, as we're getting close to the building, he comes out and he says, look up in the sky. And he's telling us what that is because you could see the cloud. And mm -hmm. and we thought he was messing with us. <laughs> and um, it's it, it's like, no, 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 I'm telling you the truth. The Challenger just blew up and that's the cloud from oh, it right there. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, and so we all go run into the chapter hall and sat there and watched the, the, the rest of that day was spent watching the mm -hmm. news. And I, and when, all this stuff started coming out about there were people saying it's the weather's not right. The temperature's not right. We've had problems with this O-ring and they're trying to stop it from happening. And there's such pressure to get the challenger up into space on NASA, afraid of 
you know, losing funding and stuff like this that the powers that be said we're going. And, yep, there they went. Um, and that's just, uh, and there's so many of these others that you, as you look at what's happened where people are forced to make these, um, you know, t- decisions, if nobody's listening to them, it's like, what I, I, you know, yeah, I can only, only imagine. I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's one of the, to, to me, just a side note not to go there, but it's one of the scary things about autonomous drive driving vehicles. <laughs> um, you know, it's like, it's like, I'm waiting for one of those things to, you know, do more than just stop and not know where to go or something like that. So but. they already have. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, um, well, cool. Thank, you know, one of the things that uh, um, you mentioned earlier that I want to bring us back to, which is, you know, tell us about work blending art and science for positive system change. So how do we change that? And we kind of blend, we, we connect that science and art together there. Well, again, I think it's it goes back to changing the culture of it's a game changer when you do that and you can let amazing things happen. And we have some great examples of this. I mean, you know, the fact that Apple started in a garage and they had a different culture and Zappos is another example. Amazon, I suppose. I mean, there's there's pros and cons of all of them. But if you look at where they were and how they got to where they are, uh, there's a, 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 and some of the best hospitals and other schools that, that sometimes they win awards and sometimes they don't. Or even if you want to go down to the micro of a classroom. And I know that you and I have post, certainly, I mean, we both became teachers. So that, says to me that we both had great examples somehow sometime in our life of people who not only made it safe to say something but they cared about what you were saying they weren't just trying to entrap you very much so very much so that's uh it's (laughs) it's an interesting thing because i've worked in an environment before where it's not you know you're expected to uh, just do what you're told and, and uh show up and get that stuff done and, uh, but don't, don't try and counter or, or, or say something that's opposite of what you're being told to do or something. Exactly. And if I might add um, another way, I mean, to more directly answer your question about uh, blending art and science. Um, when we do these improv things, it's not just a one day thing. We do the train the trainer so that instead of put it this way, scrolly back, when you have a new employee, you usually uh, corporates do a, a corporate, they have corporate trainers who do a, a one day of education, you know, here's where this is and here's where that is. And this is how you fill out this form and blah, 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 blah. And they might do some icebreaker with the new people, but that has nothing usually to do with then they go to whatever department they're working with and that they're, they're They're brand new to all those people, and that's where the orientation stops. So when we say we like to redo a culture, especially if there are different departments or units, whatever the case may be, is to start with the leadership and train the managers, supervisors, or whoever about this improv mindset, about having more open door times when they can uh, talk to people, and um, we call it about um, maybe it depends upon where they are, but instigating a fun night or some, not just a potluck, but maybe within a potluck, if they have a monthly time for people to get together to introduce some improv games, because as opposed to other sorts of team building games, which might take a day, you know, like uh, you might do a, a, a race or, a, you know, get, what do you call it when you're getting out of a room? Escape? There you go, escape room, yeah. Escape room or something like that. What we find, if you've ever done any of those, is that when you, you know, you um, randomly select people uh, to be on these teams to do this, which is, you know, there's some 
some value in that for sure. Um, people get to know each other and all that. But what's interesting about the dynamics of all of those sorts of games, even if you're just doing Legos, is the person or persons who feel whether they have a title or they want a title, they try and commandeer the leadership of that game and everybody else understands it it's unsaid but they're like okay fine steve's gonna take the lead in this whatever it's just a game i guess i better because why because they they know that everybody who's there knows what's happening and in the future you don't know if steve's gonna be your boss or maybe he is your boss and you don't want to take him off so we instead of freeing ourselves from a hierarchy we're embedding it even more this is an inculcation whereas if we train people how to really do a great debriefing and how to really uh, present improv then on in their departments then maybe once a month or however they want to do it and it's a great way to get new people involved too you do some of these exercises which are trust building which are problem solving etc exercises and again because it's not role playing about the actual work environment it's it's disassociated from that it's a playful environment and what we know is from the research and that I, I did some also with my doctoral work is that it's kind of like you can't unring a bell once you've been exposed to this and had relationship with people in a non-confrontational sort of way you've had fun with them you remember that i like that that's awesome that really is because that's you know it's it's it really has the essence in it of, of a team um, coming together where, you know, you don't have to, well, not only, you don't have to just really be enamored with each other as much as you recognize the differences and you can come together and work together and it to whatever that common goal is. And I think that's a huge deal sometimes when, uh, you know, if, the, if you're in an environment where your opinion doesn't matter or, um, you know, the idea that, uh, trying to come to that somebody in that environment may not even know some of the simplest stuff that's going on in your world. Like, uh, like you just spent five days in the hospital or something like that. You know. Well, not only that, you know, as educators, we come together so seldom, you know, it's passing in the hall. It's maybe a lunch or something like that, but how many of us are actually, in one another's classroom for very often i hardly ever right we we're all, we work as little islands and um this is this is a great way to get to know each other and support each other i love that you got that right that's because i i like to say there used to be a there, there's a convenience store out there called 7-eleven and uh they used to have a commercial a while ago that uh, it it showed these people saying good morning to each other as they're coming out of their driveways, as they're coming out of their houses, going into their cars. Hi, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? And it, the commercial was, are you a hi, how are you doing guy or something like this? And it, their whole point was that you needed 7-Eleven coffee to get you to talk and stuff like this. <laughs> but the, the I think in teachers in classrooms in in building schools a lot of times what happens is that we become those hi how you doing oh good all right and you kind of there's there's no other interaction than that as you go into your classroom shut your door and do um your lesson for your lessons for the day or whatever and that's so true and i think that it has a lot to do with why that separate sort of thing will happen and so getting the time to come together and and do some improv or do some uh some sort of activity that makes you laugh or have fun or whatever is important. It's true. It's better than going to a comedy show. And what I found the very first time I presented um, this work to um, a business group was uh, there were a lot of people who arrived with their arms across their chest. It's like, oh no, don't tell me, you know, <laughs> I'm not the person who likes to be on stage. Don't make me do this. <laughs> 
And and I, my promise was that they would not feel uncomfortable. So we started in, you know, pairs and such like that. And um, what happened at the end of the day was that everybody was so shocked that uh, a couple of things. One was um, I made friends with X person who I was sure I would I couldn't stand, but I never really knew that person. And just in doing some of these exercises, we formed a friendship. And that was really great to know for the boss that, gee whiz, these people who couldn't speak to each other are suddenly on a team as a team. This is this is priceless. How does that happen? And then the other one is that people kept saying it's too bad everybody couldn't know this work because it's so valuable and and uh Again, it was my very first workshop where this one guy who was very quiet, he said to me, I think this is going to help my marriage. Wow. 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 That's cool. That's it's interactions. They're so important, but sometimes so hard to make happen. (laughs) But Unless you participate or do whatever. I I had to laugh because when you're talking about arms folded and stuff like this, you know, that's uh, yeah, <laughs> been there. <laughs> so, sure, understand. Yeah, we all are. So, I mean, we're trained to be observant and critical. Yes, it's why we're professionals. Awesome. I, all right, so let's take a scenario here. Uh, as, so, my audience is educators of all types. Something that has happened since the pandemic has been the number of teachers that have left the profession. I mean, burnout mm-hmm. is at an all-time high. What thoughts mm-hmm. do you have about this? Oh my goodness. Where to begin? Well, as you say, burnout, it, it, that's a, an umbrella term that we use for lots of things happening to just, you know, step on your last nerve and, and you suddenly you realize I can't do this anymore. And um, sometimes, well, I will say that part of the problem is certainly not that doesn't have to do with the hierarchy of how to get paid or your supervisor or your principal or, or things like that. Because I think most of us who are teachers go into it understanding that there's an administrative arm of any industry that, you know, sort of lopes along and we put up with it. That's usually not the problem, I think, for teachers. I think for teachers, it, it's more societal that we have found, if you remember, oh my goodness, one of my favorite books growing up is the Anna Green Gables series. You know, remember what her teaching was like, or the Laurel In- Laura Ingalls Wilder, The Little House on the Prairie. You know, these are teachers. Right. And and to and and to see the sorts of difficulties and problems that they had with one room school rooms children of all ages and different abilities coming in and they had to seamlessly figure a way to in face with all of these children at the same time and get them to learn and and they had stringent expectations but they usually didn't have more than about a dozen people in the room so Crowded classrooms got to be number one. And when you have crowded classrooms, we know we can't. Are, we only have two eyes, and it's it's that's hurting cats, especially when you have the societal familial breakdown of um, children whose parents are so busy, right? Whose parents are so busy they don't hardly have time to talk to them. Maybe they're, and, and I know you and I probably know lots of people who feel that both parents have to work and maybe both parents have to work 12 hour shifts or whatever. And they just, every morning, it's a scramble to get everybody out the door. And maybe they have to leave before their children even, you know, are out to school. I mean, maybe those children have to sort of get themselves going and, you know, it happens to the best of us. And maybe we're working late and maybe we don't have time to have dinner together, to really talk to each other. And children feel so often discouraged because they don't have that nurturing and support at home. 
And there are others who, of course, many of us, golly, I don't know what the latest statistic is, but it's got to be at least 40% that only have one parent in the house. So that's, you know, that's a challenge. And so the students come and they're not at their best self. They may not even, even though we have school lunches and so forth, I mean, you don't know what they ate for breakfast, if they're nutritionally ready to learn. You don't know if they were, um, if they got much sleep. And then there's that other overarching problem about the entitlement feeling like, okay, well, you know, my parents says I have to go. I would rather not. I see other people and maybe they're in a place where there's gangs and stuff and they see younger people making money and, and getting the glitzy things that they think they need. They can't see uh, the reason that they have to be there, especially if you as the, the teacher are not as engaging as you could be because you are overburdened with work because you have so many students in your in your class my goodness it is um so i it's not ironic i suppose that the research also shows that so many students you just get passed and passed and passed because it's easier and that hurts the soul of a teacher to have to to be told to have to do that and um so i i think meritocracy is now a dirty word and it's it's a very sad thing in teaching and those are many reasons why they why teachers get burned out oh you got that right there's there's so many different things and and during the pandemic trying to teach online and uh, kids could actually just uh. turn you off, <laughs> which was interesting too, you know. And uh, um, and then coming back from that, uh, you know, because the the numbers who've it, it's starting to turn a little bit. There's starting to be a few more that are enrolling in teaching schools and stuff like this, so they can become classroom teachers. But I think uh, you know, there's there's still a lot of that left over because it's it's a demanding job. I mean, you're working with other people's children, and you you hope that they have a certain amount of decorum when they come in there and so that you can help it'll help you do what you do i, I gotta go back mm -hmm. to something you said earlier one of the things you got to do when you're in your world is be you <laughs> and if you can't be you you know that's that doesn't help and uh because i i had a blast teaching and uh there are many challenges and stuff like this but if i couldn't be me um that then that would be uh, that'd be one of those things that would totally just just throw me out the window type thing. And uh, but uh, one of the things I loved about teaching is that uh, never a dull moment. And mm. I think you have to figure out how to make it so you don't take things personally. <laughs> and and uh, indeed, it's good stuff. So uh, so good stuff. I I, uh, I let's let's talk about this for a second. If you had a choice, if you had a you're either going to talk to an audience of teachers or an audience of administrators. Which one would you choose, and what would you tell them if given a chance to talk to them about, you know, if it's teachers surviving the classroom, if it's uh, administrators, you know, creating a better work culture? Which one do you want to talk? Well, both. Okay. <laughs> and I would encourage them that whether they're in the classroom or uh, adjudicating the machinations of the school, uh, I think I'd encourage them that they need to remember every day that they have the future of the world in their hands. You know, um, I think I would tell them some stories about some of the most influential teachers that I ever had and why um, I would, um, I would encourage them to remind the students that although they don't understand maybe why algebra is important now, <laughs> it's it's going to be important in very practical ways in the future. And that uh, in order for us to get real world solutions, I mean, to get, uh, to use your example, to have people who are able to be a good surgeon, who are able to be the best mechanic to take care of your cars i mean you know 
no matter what profession, what sort of work they go to, um, to to take learning seriously is is a great gift that in this country, golly, people fought long and hard to be able to do that. And not all countries have that gift of free education. It's, uh, and I think also, here's another thing. I think that students want people, want teachers that they're not like afraid of, but only in it, like, a in a just way. They want teachers who are kind, but just. So they know that if, this other student does something that's not right that that and it interferes with everybody else learning that that will be taken care of in and that these things are spelled out at the beginning um <clears throat> as i'm sure you used to do uh in a way that is um it sounds militaristic i think some of the best teachers that i ever had sounded really strict at first and said these are the premise of the ways that you're going to behave in this class and this is the promise of what's going to happen if you basically give all your all into this class and you know the classroom's the microcosm of the universe oh yeah like the family and uh, it's a great opportunity that teachers have to mold and shape character, especially for students who don't necessarily have six hours a day with their parents. I mean, what a gift. Very much so. This is, you know, it's, uh, I appreciate you talking about this. You know, it's, uh, um, it's one of those things where I, just, I think the, the mat, it, you have to figure out that you have to establish boundaries and parameters and all this sort of stuff so that, um, like you were talking about this kind of militaristic aspect of it that creates there, but you can, you can uh, smile and you can joke and you can have fun, but you have to have the, bo the, the boundaries that uh, let the kids know that, yeah, I will take care of <laughs> if somebody's causing issues or uh, if you're, uh, you know, whatever it is that might be necessary for me to address needs to be addressed. And otherwise we go about our, you know, learning what it is we're, we're here to, to talk about and discuss and, and make happen and, and generate some cool um, conversations and understanding of the world. I have to tell you, you know, one of the f funny things that I'll never forget was you got one of those things going on in a classroom where everything, everybody, you know, you got some good discussion going on. You got this happening, you got that happening. And a kid raised her hand because she wanted to interject something. And whenever she talked, it was kind of like, you know, this is, this is going to be awesome. It's going to bring us, really she's gonna ha she had this great insight of how things should happen and uh so i'm like this is gonna be awesome she raised her hand and i said yes and uh i, I st still remember her name and i still remember this moment because she said to me and this had been bugging her the whole time that we had this class going on she said mr Moletto, did no one ever tell you that polka dots don't really go with stripes <laughs> it was a 10th grader <laughs> and i said and i said uh, and it was funny because I've known some colleagues who that would have been, you know, like the last straw or something like this. And I said, ah, I said, uh, you've known me long enough. Do I really only have my own style? <laughs> and she said, yeah, well, I it think tells right. me she had the agency to speak up. Yes. And that's the good on you. Thanks. Thanks. That's yeah. Cause I did not blow up. I did not get mad or anything like that. Instead, I, I came up with a goofy answer and, uh, and, she said, "Oh, that makes sense." And away we went. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was like, uh, um, I, yeah, it's to me the environment has to be such that you can feel free to ask <laughs> and know that your legs aren't going to get chopped off as a result of whatever that answer is coming. And so. you know that even though you may not see those students ever again, you've had a positive impact on their lives. Thanks. And I think that's one of the things that uh, you wish teachers, you know, as, as they struggle or they're, they're thinking that they're getting burned out, maybe they really just need a break <laughs> because the impact is there. And a lot of times you don't find out until you meet them 10 years down the road and uh, you happen to be at a gas station or something. They come up to you and say, I don't know if you remember me or not. Um, and sometimes that's 30 years, 20 years, whatever down the road. And uh, 
which is a cool give back from the profession. So let, let's, uh, um, let's as we're closing up here, one of the things I want to make sure I get you a chance to do is you do speaking engagements. You talked about that. How does, uh, how does somebody uh, reach out to, to get you to, you know, to maybe talk about uh, speaking or presenting at their school or their business or whatever, or, the right. Program. They can go to my educational website, which is simple. It's my name, candycampbell.com. That's Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L.com. There's a contact form there. And I can say that <clears throat> if um, your listeners go there, they can contact me and and, and tell me uh, which of the the books they'd like to see the first front matter and chapters of and um, on improv, I'm happy to send them. Whether uh, it's improv to improve your leadership team, the newer one, or improv to improve healthcare, yeah, I'll share that with them. Very cool, and I'll put that information in the show notes so they can reach out to you. And yes, it, and it's it's nice when a website is easy to remember because it is it is your name. So. Uh, very cool, but that'll be in the in the show notes, so it's easy to find. And I got one last question for you that I like to ask all my guests, and it goes uh-huh. like this: Do you have a teacher in your past who made a difference in your life? If so, who was it? And what would you say if given the chance to say thank you? Oh my goodness, there are so many, and I'll tell you the first one that really made a difference in my life was Mrs. Uh, Wetterborg. A funny old name. I I never heard anybody with that name since. She was my fourth grade teacher, and she gave us an assignment. I've always liked to write in class. She gave us an assignment to to write a Thanksgiving story. And um, I, maybe because I've always had a big imagination, instead of just a story, I wrote a little play, kind of like I, I'm sure I was influenced by the Jetsons in the day. And I wrote a play about this futuristic family who came together for dinner and instead of having a big turkey and everything, they were eating little pills and it was a comedy and uh, the class loved it. And she didn't tell me this, but she gave this play, a copy of this play to the principal and they came back to me and, and, and they asked me to produce and direct it for the all school assembly. This was K through eight. Nice. And so that was the first time. I, oh, and then I became the narrator of that that play. Uh, that was that was a big highlight. Um, I will tell you if I can add another one. Most definitely. No Willard Bone, my high school journalism that talked about the moral imperative that journalism's journalists have to, whenever possible, go to the primary source and get the words specifically down either with a tape recorder or whatever it is. And he told me that I had great promise as a writer. Um, You know, there's several, oh my goodness, so many teachers who, who were so impactful in my life. Love it. It's awesome. Uh, Candy, thank you so much for sharing your world. I appreciate it. You got all kinds of cool stuff going on and uh, I'm wishing you the best in all you do. Thank you, Steve. It's been a pleasure. Hey, you have been listening to Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right here. The opinions expressed on Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 are those of the guests and hosts. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes. Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.